Hey, we got sound. Let's try this again. Hi, everybody. It's Tuesday. This is To Write and Have Written. I'm Marvin Arndonk Ba. And what you didn't hear me say was that I had made some changes on this local machine and set myself up for some technical difficulties. And yeah, apparently no sound was one of them. So <laughs> welcome, everybody. Um, let's go ahead. Just uh, again, we're going to start with our Quitter's Day Achievement Party. We're actually going to do that first tonight. Um, January the 19th is unofficially Quitter's Day. Apparently, statistically, that's the day people tend to fall off the wagon on their New Year's resolutions. But we made resolutions uh, two weeks ago. Resolutions is completely the wrong word. We actually worked out goals and uh, doable plans to work toward those goals. Um, so there's a whole episode on that. Do that separately. Um, but I asked people to state goals, and um, if we are still on the wagon as of today, then I have prizes and we're having our achievement party. So hooray, I'm glad everybody's here and now you can hear me. So awesome. So uh, very quickly, I if you posted your goals on my, um, on my uh, social media link that I, I asked for, um, then go ahead and throw into the chat where you are with that and then, um, you know, and we're not gonna, there is no shaming here. Like if you're making progress, great. Nobody was supposed to be, be there yet. We're just, are you are you still on the wagon? That's what we're after. Yes, on the wagon. Thank you, Shy Red Fox. Awesome. And just a reminder, Shy Red Fox is gonna be doing um, a bonus episode with me tomorrow night. So more information on that later. Um, so, and so awesome guys. And then what I have here, let me pull out. Writers love notebooks. We collect them. We don't write in them. That is, they, they are just for looking, not for using. So, oh, Joe, you got 500 words a day uh, and you manage 400 even with the weekends off. Sweet. Nice. Um, anyway, so this shiny, shiny um, Lecterm 1917 notebook. These, these are, this is a lined notebook. These go for like 20 bucks. These are nice notebooks. So you, we're going to raffle one of these off. You can uh, get it delivered to you germ free and everything and then um, you can hold it and never open it and never ever ever write in it because we don't all right um bridgers within parameters hey you hope to be doing better that's okay you're the, just the 19th you're statistically ahead so we're good awesome um and okay <laughs> elena did not post the goal on social media but she's still in the wagon that counts that's good all right so i'm gonna open the raffle and if you guys have been um well i'm gonna try to open the raffle come on oh see above every technical difficulties there we go should be working now so you can put exclamation mark raffle into the chat and um if you are a subscriber get some bonus tickets there um otherwise everybody gets in just for that and we'll do that in five minutes um, <laughs> yes, Bridger says we're appealing to her love of having notebooks for having. It's for having, not for writing in. Okay, just just for having. That's how that works. But uh, but these are these are nice. So okay. So while that's going, okay, everybody should be getting raffle in. Are you guys getting tickets? I don't see the ticket. Is it coming back and telling you that you have tickets? Oh, curses on my my thing. All right. So while that's running, I'm going to, no tickets. Why is it not doing tickets? Okay, well, Kate got a ticket. It just likes, just likes Kate. Okay, maybe it's just running slow. Okay. All right. Oh, why does it have to have an, okay, fine. I don't know. This, this way. Oh, I have no idea what's going on. I'm so sorry, guys. All right, let me tell you who's coming in tonight. <laughs> so uh, we have tonight um, Amelia Blazer. It's Dr. Blazer, but I call her Emmy. I've known Emmy a long while. She is awesome. I actually met her through costuming and cosplay. She does fantastic and amazing work, but she's coming in tonight to talk to us about metal casting, which um, she's been, I'm just gonna like let her show off because she just has amazing things. So um, awesome, thanks Shy Red Fox. You guys take care of that in the chat and <laughs> I'm going to bring Emmy in. So please, everything just work. Um, and we're going to hope that we have a voice from Emmy. Emmy, can, <laughs> can you speak to us? 
Uh, am I coming through? Is it, it working? Okay, I'm seeing the sound bar move. I'm just starting to feel like everything's trying to trying to break tonight. So um, I, I I'm I'm seeing your sound bar move. I can hear you. Um, it sounds. Oh, people can hear you. This okay. is fantastic. Hooray! Wonderful. Awesome. Ah, oh, so sorry, guys. All right, so sorry, <laughs> Emmy. Like that was that was not supposed to be that complicated. Um, you know what? You're better at Streamlabs than I am. So yeah. <laughs> This is, um, it's, it's all just gnashing of teeth. I think that's, that's must be the key. So, so speaking of gnashing of teeth, um, what oh. do you have for us, Emmy? <laughs> yeah. So, so um, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I, I met Laura a number of years ago. It's getting farther and farther away. I know. Um, before <laughs> I was in dental school and now I'm like a full fledged dentist. So that tells you how long we've known each other, <laughs> but, um, I uh, I do metal casting primarily as a hobby, but um, it was part of my education uh, for like learning how to make gold crowns and stuff like that. And so I did a little bit of that in school. Um, I really liked it and then kind of revisited it later um, once I had a proper setup to do that, AKA a backyard that I could set things on fire in without <laughs> judgy people. Um, that's, always, that's always helpful. And um, so I've been, I've been kind of doing different types of metal casting, uh, probably about three or four different techniques, depending on how you break it down um, for the past two years or so. And um, I'd like to, to share my, my fun stories <laughs> and disasters, which I have multiple with you guys. So we, um... Oh, Bridge was saying everyone deserves a backyard they can set things on fire in. Yeah, which is, I think a good backyard is judgment free zone. <laughs> so um, one of the things I asked uh, you about is, you know, like oh, we're, we're this is a writing channel. Um, so we're all writing. Um, uh, you know, a lot of us like I write angsty epic fantasy. I, you know, a lot of us are doing um, medieval or renaissance or you know some historical setting or some fantasy world or, or something. And, um, you know, most of the stuff, like if I wanted to look up now, like how would I make this thing, you know, it's going to be you know, machine stamping or it's going to be, you know, a bunch of stuff that's not going to apply to my world. And um, so I guess, can you walk us through like the most, first of all, just start with the super, super basic, I know metal casting exists. <laughs> I like, do you just take metal and then you throw it and now I've cast it into the thing? You know, how does, how does this work? What is the super, super basic walk through? Uh, <laughs> and then we'll get into like the fun stuff with it. So, um, so metal casting is, is basically, um, everybody remembers the, the phases of, um, matter that you learned in school of like water, you know, so you have a liquid, a solid, a gas. We're not going to talk about gas metal because that's, really crazy but um basically we're trying to bypass uh, the plasma stage oh God, yeah. like yeah. no no plasma no metal plasma tonight <laughs> very bad um but the uh casting metal is basically um taking a solid metal applying heat until it turns into a liquid and then pouring it into whatever shape you want it and allowing it to re-solidify again and so, um, so i'm hoping um you know that you know, there's, there's some sort of mold or something that we have, um, yeah. hopefully prepared before we had liquid metal and needed a place to put yes. it. And <laughs> there are so many molds. Um, so, so kind of to go, um, uh, more with like the historical slant, I also do a little bit of, um, Viking reenacting as well. So, um, I'm a little bit more familiar with like Viking iron age stuff, which I think kind of dovetails nicely with like the fantasy yeah. type angle. Um, but you, if you're looking for like a pre industrial revolution, um, type of mold that you would want to pour your metal into, it could be made of a number of things. Um, just, uh, f extremely like dried or baked clay um is is one option um there are soapstone molds that um where basically if you get a block of soapstone which is a very um very very soft stone um you can actually take a block cut it in half to have two pieces that are perfectly like um flat against each other and then carve a shape into um you know both halves and then you know 
give yourself a little pour spout and sandwich those two together. Um, that is something that they did during Viking times and, and not just for Vikings, but many, many Bronze Age cultures. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of combinations of like sand and mud and clay um, and all of that. Just that anything that can resist you. that heat. It, exactly. So. so it just needs to be strong enough to not break apart when you pour the metal into it. Um, and it needs to be able to withstand the heat and sometimes it gets destroyed sometimes it doesn't it kind of depends on on the type of casting that you're doing okay so we're actually getting questions about this in the chat from bridger but i'm going to interrupt this just one second since i had so much chaos at the start let me wrap mm -hmm. up that raffle and get sure. that done and then we'll come back and we'll do all the things um so let me try to um see ah, joe joe you are a winner um so that's awesome so um if you want to private message me with a mailing address, I will ship you a um, a notebook to to hold, not to write in, just to hold. So congrats. Um, so send, send me a mailing address for that. And then anybody who is still on the wagon and showed up tonight, you have your choice of one, an ebook from my catalog if you if there's something you would like, or two, if you are a writer and you are more interested in getting feedback on your work, um, I will do 2000 words of edits for you, but you must, um, you must be present to win. So <laughs> sorry if you're hearing this on the podcast later or catching it on YouTube later, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not open to everyone forever. Must be here tonight on the stream. So I have to have seen you in the chat. So, um, and then thank you guys for, uh, letting me be disjointed and jump back and take care of the achievement party there. And now back to Emmy. Um, Absolutely. And Bridger was asking about, um, you know, are the, the molds withstanding the heat and then how, how do you demold? So, so yeah. So depending on um, what material you're using, generally speaking, the soapstone molds are reusable. Um, you're going to be pouring metal in there that doesn't get super duper hot. Um, so it, relatively speaking, so like, um, you might do a bronze or a pewter casting, something like that. Um, but the important part about if you want to have a reusable mold, you have to be able to separate the two halves, um, or, or just one, one thing, pull, pull the metal casting out of it without tearing off pieces of your mold. And so that's going to depend uh, on the shape of whatever you're creating. And I actually brought a couple of examples here. Uh, I Yay, didn't realize examples. we were going to be doing. Um, you want to have something called a path of draw. Um, and so that means that you there is some orientation that you can take a shape out of your mold or some sort of direction that you can pull it away from where nothing's going to lock underneath it. Um, so if you look at it from that direction, so I have like a little, little, this was a cloak pin I made. Um, it's got a flat back on one side and then it's got some dimension on the other side. Um, you basically, if you stare at it directly from this, you can see every single surface of this. There's, there's nothing that's the, you know, mold is going to have to hook under and lock, lock it into. So, um, this is something that I could either cast into an open mold. So I just basically have like the impression of this and pour my metal into it, into the ground, and then just lift it out when I'm done. Um, or I can choose to make it a two part mold um and have like a, a back covering over it um and then just pull the two halves apart later when i when i want to get it back and so it would actually end up looking something like this this is a casting that was not quite perfect so i didn't end up finishing it but um that's how i chose to uh to cast that one so yeah so I have never done any metal casting because it frankly scares me. Um, but the, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, There's I, fire. I'm sure it, like, it looks fun and that's why it scares me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, when we do, um, Elena and I do the uh, the mold making and casting with sil with resin mm -hmm. and silicone. And um, so I'll talk about if we're doing that that single thing, you, um, 
you know, the impression kind of thing. You, mm-hmm. you want no spaces that an ant can hide from the rain is how I usually try to describe that to our first time oh, people. Yeah. yeah. You're just like, the, cause you don't want any hooks, but you have done like some really cool, much more complex things. Um, and with multi-part molds and, and just all kinds of stuff. So I'm um, like, first, just brag, yeah. just, just, just oh. brag for a second. And then we'll, then we'll come back and pick things up. Oh, okay. So I, I brought a couple of examples of like things that I've made. Um, mostly I, I do metal casting for costuming and stuff like that. So um, this is, I'll show you my first costume project and I'll show you my most recent one. So this is a belt buckle um, that I made. It is made out of um, a like zinc and aluminum alloy, but um, this is, uh, I, I wanted to get into it, not just because I was like, look at me, I'm so cool, I can work with metal, but because when you're doing um, costume work, if you have a belt that you actually want to have, like hold up your pants, you can't make the belt buckle out of resin or something like that, because it's right. really gonna, um, it, it has to hold your up. Your pants are going to come off. Yeah, your yeah, pants are going to fall down. <laughs> and I speak out. that from experience because <laughs> I have definitely had a resin belt buckle break on me and then had very loose pants for the rest of the day. So <laughs> so I was like, oh, this would be a good project. It's it's a nice, easy shape. Um, it's pretty. So that was made with um, sand casting, which I can tell you what that is in, in a little bit and how cool that is. That's a really beginner friendly type of uh, metal making. And then... Um, this coat was um, another project that I made, but it had these little metal doohickeys here that all um, run along the side. And these are a lot more delicate and refined, and there's like moving parts and stuff like that. I was going to say, they, they're, um, they're not rigid. They're, that's multi- multiple pieces yeah, going so on Yeah, they, so they were cast in multiple pieces um, and uh, then assembled together later. Um, and I actually used a combination of 3D printing and um, uh, castable resin for that, which I can also get into. So that was like super, super high tech. And then the sand casting is like super, super low tech. And there's a lot of cool stuff in between. So, so the, just uh, since you can't see the chat, the chat is appreciating okay. your work because Yay. it's very shiny and very I, cool. So the yeah. shiny is the most important part. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned super super briefly like um the what metal you were using there but you know what what are our metal options for doing this can i just grab any old pot metal can do, oh. can i can i melt down a pot and make this happen you know how, do, um, how does this need to happen probably not so so <laughs> generally speaking if, if you were trying to do this um in modern day it's it's best to go with some kind of casting grain or um like some kind of block that's uniform of of the metal so a a lot of people um kind of choose aluminum as one of the first metals that they they want to mess around with because it's it's relatively easy to melt it has a pretty low melting uh, temperature compared to a lot of other metals um but people get the idea of oh well i'm just gonna melt down a bunch of these pop cans because like i drink a lot of soda and um you know, people recycle aluminum, and why can't I just melt the, all these cans into something cool? Which, that, that you, you asked me to talk about disasters, <laughs> so <laughs> yes. um, yeah. <laughs> that you you generally speaking want to have a pretty pure source of your metal. You don't want to have a lot of um, dye or plastic accompanying it or um, like dried up little soda dregs. Um, so any anything that's gonna uh, in- introduce impurities into your metal, you know, just, just from a, um, am I gonna get a good casting out of it perspective? Like absolutely, you wanna ha- minimize the number of imperfections that you have in your metal, but also from a safety perspective, if you get like a bunch of really weird gross stuff in there, depending on what you grab to melt down, um it 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 could be unsafe like you could create vapors that are unsafe to inhale you can um if there's any water left in your pop can when you try to melt it down um water turns to steam and steam is a whole lot bigger than water so it can create you know splashes of molten metal metal? Uh, yeah yeah it's it's not not a good idea so like 
generally speaking, if you want to get into like aluminum, um, you know, get get like automotive parts that you can chop down that are like. But Emily, I have seen so many aluminum. movies yeah. where our heroes just run around and grab everything metallic and throw it into a pot and then forge like an epic sword. Like that's how that works, right? Like. I guess if you, if you can forge an <laughs> epic letter opener that way. That would be okay. really, yeah. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll keep that for my epic <laughs> opening, um, scenes. I've got one of those coming up. I'll make sure and grab that. So, yeah. um, yeah, so we've got uh, <laughs> the chat. Well, now I'm curious what happened with the soda cans. So, um, we'll see, uh, see how it works. Well, I, I was, I have never I personally tried to melt down a soda can because my, my metallurgist father was like, don't, don't do that here some <laughs> automotive stock so uh, elena's pointing out that the soda cans would work in video game crafting because that's that's the true grab everything absolutely so, yeah there we go all right um so with all that you know if i'm you know if i'm writing a world where i want this to be a thing what what needs to be in my world you know what stage of of uh, development, I guess, te what technology do I, does my character need to have access to in order to be really, you know, able to reliably cast something and, and have it get beyond letter opener status? <laughs> so, um, generally speaking, you're, I mean, if you, if you go back and do either research on bronze, bronze age cultures or iron age cultures, the minimum that you're going to need is, is going to be one of those. And so it's going to, kind of depend on um, what metals you want to work with. So um, in the Bronze Age, and the, and the reason why those were primarily differentiated from each other is that iron has a much higher melting temperature than bronze. Um, iron tends to be stronger. It can be forged, um, meaning that you can um, do all sorts of stuff where like you, you know your typical blacksmith shop where you're taking a bar of iron and you're smashing it into like a long skinny shape and then folding it over again and smashing it again and folding it over um and basically changing the structure of the metal and the way that the the crystals in the metal are arranged to create a really strong and resilient metal um so there are definitely you know if you're going back all the way to bronze age culture where they didn't have iron to make swords out of there are definitely like bronze swords that were cast but the big technology advance was that iron was a lot more was a lot harder and more resilient and you could make more durable tools that you know just kind of beat the pants off of the bronze ones so um generally speaking you know you need some kind of source of clay or mold making material or the soapstone or you know what what have you um you need fire um and a way to contain it so that you can create the temperatures required for working with the metal um and you're also going to need tools to um to not set yourself on fire or burn your hands or other other types of stuff so all of all of that depending on which cultures you're looking at, they, there are some pretty creative ways around that. And the, and the, we're, we're, we're now passing into the territory of Lara knows just enough to sound stupid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I know that, you know, you, this is not something where I can just put my pot full of metal chunks on my campfire and it's going to turn into nice usable liquid metal. So what, um, when you're talking about that, what kinds of furnaces would be necessary to make this happen? Obviously, it's going to vary somewhat with what metal we're melting, but uh, yes, what what give me give me a range, give me a concept here. So actually, I I have I, I brought this in because I thought we might be talking about this today. Um, I have the furnace that I like to use in my backyard for. Um, ah, I'm gonna sit it on my lap here, and hopefully, I can hold it up and adjust it. Woo. So, um, oh, I don't know how good this picture is, but basically um, you it's it's going to be a closed container. So this here has a lid. The the metal and stuff goes inside and the key feature of um, any furnace where you want it to get really, really hot is it's going to be mostly enclosed, but it's going to have a hole in the top that um, air uh, can escape from. Um, you're going to have some kind of air in inlet 
at the bottom that is going to feed oxygen to the fire. Um, and generally speaking, the, your, your heat source is going to be the hottest at the bottom, and then the, the temperature is going to go down as you get closer to the, the air exhaust at the top. So, um, you know, I have a, in, in my backyard, I've got a crucible, which is made out of graphite that um, sits in there and actually contains the molten metal. Um, but I was actually just reading up on uh, Viking Iron Age uh, smelting uh last night and just to kind of brush myself up on things and like they they made these things out of um stacks of sod where they you would take just a square of sod put it on the ground cut a hole in it line that layer with clay put another s layer of sod cut another hole in it and, and create like this this um funnel of of you know clay lined um sod basically with like a little outlet at the bottom and a little hole at the top and like that's what they would use to smelt iron um in some cultures so it you know but the basic anatomy of a furnace is the same is that you you have your air inlet you have your chamber and you have your exhaust at the top okay so um, we're getting questions in the chat, but you're doing a fantastic job of as the questions come up, you're oh, okay. continuing on and answering them. So um, so lovely. Uh, keep that up. It's really good. Um, <laughs> so um, I have no idea now. I got distracted by the chat. Let me check my notes. What else, what else did I want to ask you? Um, oh, um, so we talked... I, one, one thing I want to hit is just common misconceptions about, you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, like I can just can just grab jewelry and pop cans and you know whatever and throw them in and make a thing um what are the other things that you know we all have the experience that we're watching a movie or we're reading a book and we're like are you freaking kidding me did you even wikipedia okay and um so what are the things that when you're watching a movie or reading um that immediately leap out to you so we can make notes on how to avoid that um I, oh gosh i'm i'm trying to think so so I think the biggest thing that uh, it really pulls me out of my, my suspension of disbelief is the time involved. So uh, the casting metal and smelting metal and all of that other stuff, like especially if you're doing it in a pre-industrial revolution setting, um, is not like a quick snappy thing. Um, like when I do it in my backyard, it usually takes... Um, you know, several hours if I'm just casting, uh, if I'm just pouring the metal into a mold I've already prepared. But like if I'm doing something like a lost wax casting, uh, which I can get into a little bit if you want me to talk about that, um, like the burnout involved in that, it sometimes takes eight or 10 hours or it can take overnight. So, um, you know, you see like those cool movie montages where, um, you know, they're like hammering and like pouring metal and stuff like that. And then like two minutes later, they have like a finished piece. Um, and it's like, and you know, it's like a ring that goes on the person's finger and it's like, ah, yes, this is the ring of power. So, you know, whatever. Um, the other thing is that when when you get a fresh casting, um, it's gonna it's gonna look gross. Like it's not gonna be shiny. My my light is like making this look shinier than it actually is. This is like a matte finish. Um, it hasn't been polished. It still has the sprue attached to it. Um, if you're you know doing something that is like a higher temperature melting alloy like Jump iron. Jump in real fast. Sprue is one of those vocab yeah. terms oh, that yes. not everybody's gonna have. So um, sorry. The, the sprue is basically the part that you, the, the neck that you pour, like your, it's your pour spout. It's what's, what uh, has a whole bunch of extra metal left in it that you uh, will cut off um, once you have your finished product. But, um, you know, there, there's a so whole bunch of just, extra stuff It doesn't stuff actually just on go there. in and come out perfect yeah, in the finish. <laughs> exactly. And there's a whole bunch of like sanding and polishing and like, sandpaper and buffing wheels and all sorts of we never get the sandpaper mon montage yeah like, that never shows up <laughs> i know you just like your jewelers like sitting there for two hours just sandpapering everything before they take it over to the polishing wheel so yeah all right well let me let me guess we're getting some really good questions in the chat so let me run through those quickly um mm -hmm. 
and uh, sorry, let me catch up to where the one we you didn't answer in the thing. So um, when you've got like something like that sod furnace and you've got your crucible in the middle full of hot hot metal, um, now you want to pour it into something. How is it portable? What are you using to move that? Or um, you know, do you just as you, as uh, Pritchard said, you just poke the mold under it and hope gravity <laughs> works the right way? You know, how does how do you how is this happening? How do we do this? Um so so with the sods furnace specifically um that the purpose of that furnace was to smelt iron which um m meaning that you're taking iron ore which is um iron usually some kind of iron oxide or or iron that has a lot of impurities in it and converting it to um a like Chem more chemically pure iron. So you're not, the goal is not to actually make a shape out of it. It's to change the composition of the metal. So it doesn't necessarily matter what shape it ends up being in. So um, basically with the sod furnace, what they would be doing is chucking in, um, you know, they, they get the furnace going, they chuck in iron ore, then charcoal, then iron ore, then charcoal, and basically like just burn it all day um, to, to cause the iron to, um, it's a it's a reduction reaction if you guys are familiar with that on and a that's chemical. a day or days um, plural it, process yes, isn't it yeah, yeah like that's um, a long while and so the the end result is that you have this like ma just this blob of metallic iron at the bottom of your furnace when you're all done um and i watched this one reenactment group um like kind of be like okay well we're done now we got to get the iron out and they literally just took this big log and just jammed it in the top of the furnace to like knock off all the extra metal from the walls um and so they basically just pound it down and then like let it let it die out that you know so it's it's safe enough to reach in there and then they pull out this thing called a bloom um like a flower uh and you have this chunk of metal which um it, for if for iron specifically you wouldn't actually want to completely melt that down to a liquid again you would take it to like a blacksmithing type thing where you just heat it up hot enough to make it malleable but it would still be solid um and so yeah you basically just like let that go and then tear apart the furnace and grab your chunk of metal out of it and then um sorry I mean, guys in the chat i'm going to jump around and try to take these questions in what appears to me to be a uh, functional order. I could be wrong. Um, so then you've got your chunks of metal or you've got your, um, your sprue off your finished mm -hmm. piece. What are you using to cut those? Um, usually either saws or, um, I, I will sometimes use a Dremel tool or a rotary tool for small things, but, um, I, I've honestly found that just using a regular handsaw is, um, a lot more efficient. Um, and depending on, on the size of the piece and what you're trying to cut off, it, it's literally just like a, a handsaw from the, um, the hardware store, or there are very, very small jewelry saws that have very, very skinny blades that allow you to get, navigate curves really well and stuff like that. So, okay. Um, I'm going to share Bridger's, uh, response to, uh, because she was talking about, um, she had asked about the uh, hot, transporting the hot metal and she said, I was imagining <laughs> someone carrying like a barrel sized chunk of sod with melting metal in it, like a lava cake over to a mold. <laughs> and I knew that had to be extremely wrong. I, just, I loved the lava cake image there. So <laughs> if, if you have, uh, it, it was actually extremely interesting. Um, it, the, this group that did it, they're called Hurstwick. Um, I can send you, um, a link to the, uh, their little write up that they did on it. It's very interesting reading. Yeah, I can put uh, that, in show that out later. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then can you talk about the lost wax? Because yes. uh, people are asking about that. Exactly. So, so lost wax is really great if you want to make something that's very detailed or um, a shape that doesn't necessarily conform to a, a path of draw, uh, you know, requirement. So, um, the the nice thing is that you can make really complicated shapes like you know big fancy bronze statues of like a dude on a horse and you know it's got legs and <coughs> everything poking out everywhere um excuse me pardon me I'm getting excited about like horse statues <laughs> um but the downside is that the mold that you use uh, basically gets destroyed during the process. So it's it's a one-off thing. 
Um, and so it's called Lost Wax because the original pattern that you use to uh, eventually inform the shape of the final metal piece, you, you sculpt it in wax first. Um, then you take that and then you put it into like a special type of plaster called investment um, or, or basically anything that is going to be heat resistant enough to to handle the temperature changes and, and all the physics stuff that's going on when you pour molten metal into it. Um, but the whole process works because wax melts um, at a certain temperature. So you've got this this wax sculpture that has been coated in this special plaster. You stick it in an oven or you know some kind of heat source, and eventually the wax heats up enough that it, it liquefies and pours out of the mold. Um, and sometimes even vaporizes. So you have um, left in the plaster this hole that is perfectly shaped like whatever you want to make out of metal. Um, and so, that, so that's why it's called lost wax because the wax, wax pattern is lost in the process. You destroy it intentionally to make room for the metal to be poured in. Um, so then basically you have your um, your prepared mold and then you heat up your metal you pour it in and hopefully everything turns out well um there are a whole bunch of different techniques and if it that doesn't you, you have use. to start from scratch and, yeah and if it gone. doesn't you got to start over again and i've never ever messed anything up ever and i've always had all of my <laughs> castings succeed and they're perfect and beautiful um, while, while everything's been perfect and beautiful, um, you mentioned that sand casting is a little bit easier. So let's just assume it'll be perfect. Talk to us about sand, uh, sand casting. So, so sand casting is really fun. Um, that, that's actually, if you're looking to get into hobby casting, um, that's what I would recommend. Um, so I actually have a couple visual aids for that too. Yay. So you have something um, in sand casting, the, the main mold material is a particular type of sand that has like a certain amount of clay in it and a certain amount of like, um, you know, oil or water or depending on which type of sand you're using. It's, it's basically like the best sand castle sand you could possibly imagine. Like it just, it sticks together. It holds exactly the shape that you want it to, to hold. Um, you know, you could grab it in your hand and it would exactly like pick up the lot, the pattern of all the lines on your hand. Like nice. that's, that's the type of sand that we're, we're imagining here. Um, so you, te you have that sand and you have some kind of container. Um, this is called a flask in um, metal casting terms. And, and a flask is basically just anything that um, provides an outer structure for your mold material. Not, not like, a, like a drinky flask, but like a casting flask. Um, so in sand casting, this actually has two halves that pull apart. I'm gonna hold them up to the screen here and hope that I don't fall off the edge of the picture. But um, there's one side that has no pegs on it and then another side that has two pegs in it. So they both index together like that. And then there's even a little convenient pour spout if you choose to have your, your pour spout come out that way. Um, but what you do is you basically have your, your flat pattern. Um, you usually have to have it divided into two parts uh, along a parting line, um, So uh, which is basically like the no, no ants hiding in the rain type thing. Um, and so you put this piece on a flat surface, you take this, you put it down around it to, to kind of act as like a, a fence for the sand. And then you ha have a big, big mallet that you use to pound the sand into it. Um, then you pick it up, your pattern is, is stuck in the sand and you basically either leave it in if you're doing a two-part mold or you can pry it out if you're doing a like a flat backed thing um and you know that creates the void where you're gonna pour the molten metal into um so depending on which which type of shape you're making like there there are a couple different refinements but basically the the really cool thing about sand casting is that unlike lost wax casting um, you know, at the end, you're left with sand that you can reuse. So it's super yeah. beginner friendly. Um, I've done like multiple sand castings 
on you know a weekend where I've done like seven or eight of them um, as opposed to when I do lost wax I have to wait eight hours for one mold to burn out um, so it's so a lot more frustrating this, <laughs> if, if, if it goes have wrong. To get this amulet cast before the evil yeah. Dark Lord arrives, like in uh, 20 minutes, where then we are going to go with a sand casting uh, premise. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what are? Because um, I saw you talk about metal casting um, last May, uh, actually, and mm -hmm. um, the you were talking about pouring it, and and I had never even thought of this, but it made perfect sense. But you're talking about the the metal starts to cool as you're pouring, and so you have to make sure that it's going to stay liquid enough to get all the way to the bottom. So can yeah. you talk to us about that a little bit? Because that sounds like a way for things to go terribly wrong. Oh yeah, so so it. It's not a very like visually spectacular way of things going wrong, but if you do want to have your your metalsmith just curse and be in a bad mood for the rest of the day, like that's definitely a wrong thing that happens. So, um, getting uh, again, you're working with a liquid that has a very very high freezing point. That's you know several hundred degrees above the atmosphere that we are occupying. So, um, you know, if you, you put all this work into heating up the metal and getting it to a certain temperature, you don't just want to have it get a little bit past its melting point. You actually want to raise it a little bit beyond that. So as it starts losing heat, um, once you take the, the fire off of it, it's going to stay liquid long enough that it gets to the inside of your mold um, and fills in all those little nooks and crannies before it loses enough heat to become a solid. Um, so I have had tons of casts not turn out well because the metal has prematurely frozen. Um, and there, it's just, it's so disappointing, especially when you're doing a lost wax thing, because that's like wow. eight or 10 hours of work that's just down the drain. Um, oh. There there are tools like in an industrial setting that allow you to really like control the temperature very well so you don't have those types of issues um but like if you're you know writing for a world that doesn't have thermometers or like ir thermometers then um you know you're, you're just kind of going off the expertise of the person who's doing the melting which um can you know be very sad sometimes because i i've definitely like been like is it done yet is it done yet I think it's done and then it hasn't been done, oh. you know, like baking cookies. So. <laughs> yes. But with cookies, at least like you can keep going or you can you eat can the dough. You can still eat the but cookies. This is, yeah, you yeah, can still not, eat the dough. This is, so the question in the chat is, can you reuse that metal or does it, is it contaminated and not reusable at that point? So depending on the type of metal, um, if you don't introduce too many impurities, then you can definitely reuse it. So um, for for like the zinc and aluminum alloy stuff, I have um, messed up and remelted these so often. It's it's not great long term for the life of the metal, especially if it's an alloy, um, meaning that it's a mixture of two elemental metals. So um, like this one is a mix of zinc and aluminum. Um, bronze is a mix of uh, copper and tin. Brass is a mix of copper and zinc, I think. Um, but both of those metals, um, or, or you can have more than two metals in an alloy, uh, will have different melting points w kind of like within the metal. So there's, if you cast and recast a metal quite often, what you can do is make it what's called off composition, where the original metal might have been like 60% copper and 40% zinc, but zinc has a lower boiling point than um, copper does. So if you cast and remelt it a whole bunch, you'll actually lose more of the, the zinc every time you, you heat it up. So then it, you know, your metal properties might start changing if you cast it a whole lot. So that's um, really good to know. That's, that's yeah. fascinating. Okay. Um, so Shy Red Fox is asking about Smiths using the color of the metal, looking at it in the dark to judge the state of it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Shy Red Fox is also in some reenactment. So, um, yeah. So also, is that something that would have been, that would also apply to, you know, this, um, you know, absolutely. Like the liquid state? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so. I, I've I've heard um, I, like when I was on Twitter complaining about how I I ha was having casting mishaps. Like I I am mutuals with somebody who actually like works at a casting house, and she's like, oh yeah, you know you you probably froze it there, blah blah blah, and and she's just like, yeah, I usually just kind of like wait until it does this this and this, and like there are certain properties like it ripples in a certain way or it turns a certain color um that i i don't have intimate experience of but people who do this for a living definitely will be able to kind of visually so experience identify experience matters <laughs> yeah absolutely all right yeah so um elena's asking about um you know, she had done lost wax centrifuge casting previously but if for your average hobby caster at home is there a way to apply more pressure to force that molten metal into a more delicate or detailed mold without having a centrifuge? So um, there, there are multiple ways that you can try to force metal into a mold. Um, centrifuging it is one, um, and I, I have uh, it's it's called a casting arm in some circles, so that's what I'm used to calling it. I have used a casting arm before. Um, that's really good for like small jewelry type stuff, like, like rings um, and pendants and things like that. Um, but your other two big ones that, that I'm aware of are number one is gravity. Um, and that's going to be your most historically accurate and simple to do. Everybody's got that. Um, all, all yeah, everybody has gravity. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and a lot of that, uh, when you're using gravity to, to try to, um, force metal into a particular things, into particular shapes, a lot of that is going to have to do with your mold design as well. So, um, one of the reasons why I can cast something like this, which generally speaking has pretty skinny areas where the metal can freeze uh, pretty easily, uh, is that I have this giant reservoir of metal in the form of the sprue. So as um, you you want to design your shape such that not not only are you thinking about the final jewelry piece that you want to make after you cut all the extra stuff off but you actually want to set it up with enough um supply of molten metal to allow all of the extremities to to get filled before this starts to freeze so for example if i was having a lot of issues with casting this shape what i might want to do is um increase the height of my sprue so that when um, I'm pouring the metal in there, instead of having, you know, one inch worth of the, the weight of metal on top of it, I have three or four inches of metal pushing down and forcing, you know, the the metal to go into the bottom of the mold where, you know, my, my pattern is. Um, the other way that I have um, that a lot of like post industrial revolution casting houses do it now is, is vacuum casting um, where the uh, it's not really done in sand casting but in, in lost wax casting the the investment or the special plaster that they use as a as a mold um, if you look at it under a microscope it's not a solid block it actually has little tiny paths for air to get to to kind of permeate through that and escape because um, you know if you're trying to pour metal into a hole that's filled with air the air has to go somewhere otherwise you're right. going to have bubbles so one thing that you ca that um casters will do to help evacuate the air from from the the uh mold is to um have ha they have very fancy systems set up where there are pumps that will actually draw a vacuum on the bottom of the casting to basically suck the air out and create like a direction of flow. And I've kind of set up a very, very low tech version of that with like a, a resin degassing pot that has like a hole drilled in it um, that uh, you can see a difference. Um, it's, it's really cool because if, so you pour your metal in and then you turn your vacuum pump on and it's pulling a vacuum at the, the bottom of the thing to try and draw the, the metal into the mold more. And you'll actually be able to see this little molten metal just kind of go whoop and like get sucked down just a little bit more um, once you turn that vacuum pump on. It's pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. 
So um, question is, can you cast in stages? Do you have to do the whole cast in one go? If you do do stages, do you get problems where the layers join? I, I think generally speaking, you want to cast in all in one go. Um, there, I haven't, I, 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 I've read a lot of books and I, I am certainly not an exhaustive expert on this. So I'm sure that there are people who will, will cast, you know, multiple times, but generally speaking, you're going to have um, like expansion and contraction and like weird dimensional stuff happen at the, the layer joins because metal will shrink very slightly when it's turning from a so from a liquid into a solid, it, it will contract. Um, so, you know, you might not, you might have like a visible layer or delamination de problems between the two layers if you're trying to do that. Um, I do know that there there are some techniques out there where if you want to make um, a casting that has multiple different metals in it, um, there are some some people who will do projects where they they cast. Uh, a shape out of whatever higher temp melting temperature metal they're using, um, finish that up, and then stick it back into a mold and pour a second lower melting point metal around it to kind of act as, you know, the second filler for whatever shape they want. Um, but you're going from highest temperature to lowest temperature, and, and it's kind of done on purpose. I, I don't really okay. think that you do, like, multiple layers of the same metal. Okay. Okay. That's good. So, um, oh, got another question. How hard is it to make something with a hinge part like the belt buckle? Um, it's, you have to plan ahead to, to make something that has a hinge part. So, so like the belt buckle, um, and those, those little toggles that I made on the, on the coat, um, all of those were cast individually. Um, I suppose somebody who's really, really skilled could probably cast moving pieces um, together and then like break them apart, you know, and, and have something that's like linked. Like you could probably, if you set it up right, have like make a small linked chain out of using like the lost wax process or something. Um, but by and large, you're going to be casting those individual those pieces individually and then joining them together later um, once you've done all of your finishing and polishing. Okay. And then um, guys, if anybody has any other questions remaining, throw them in the chat now. And then I'm going to ask Emmy. So we talked about, you know, small ways things can go wrong. We know that water will cause, you know, some thrown metal. Get, what is there another way we can have something go spectacularly wrong? <clears throat> um, so, Apart from explosions, um, you, you know, I mean, never it, rule out explosions. Explosions I, are I mean, fine. But <laughs> explosions are fine, especially if you're using like gas or, or something like that. But um, I, I will say for the lower temperature metals, probably the most dramatic, like, oh, that's not right moment that I've had when um, I've been doing casting is you can overheat metal um, and it, it won't get to the point where it. Um, it turns into a gas because that's kind of crazy, but um, you can you can create issues where the metal gets hot enough that enough of it aerosolizes that you, you know you, there are fumes that are created that you don't want to breathe in. So you know you could give yourself you, yourself or your characters um, like lung issues. Um, but the the worst thing that I've ever had happen was I was trying to melt a zinc aluminum alloy um, always outside and I got it probably like six or 700 degrees higher than I should have because I just wasn't really watching my furnace and I was I put in a lot of gas through it and um, you can actually if you heat metals up to a certain point they will they're going to be in such an excited state on a molecular a molecular level that once you open the lid to your furnace and all of that, you know, to, to kind of pick up the crucible and go do what you want to do with it, um, you suddenly have an influx of oxygen come in and um, your metal can start reacting with that oxygen in very weird and funky ways. Um, 
And so in my backyard, I had I, I learned that if you overheat zinc and aluminum and then you open the top to your furnace, you get something that looks like haunted scrambled eggs. It like this this it looks like a witch's cauldron that was just like spontaneously forming this like webby, like bright yellow um spider web stuff that just spontaneously formed on the surface of my metal and i was just like what what is happening and i started trying to scoop it out and it was like it was like the consistency of packing peanuts um and i just kept scooping it out and like trying to get it off and like throwing it on the ground and just more kept springing up and i was like oh my god what is this <laughs> what is going on <laughs> um so you you can heat metals up to the point that really funky stuff happens to them sometimes if you're not controlling the environment carefully i remember when you were tweeting the haunted scrambled eggs picture yeah it was like it was yeah that's not weird. i don't think that's i don't know much about this but i don't think that's what it's supposed to look like <laughs> yeah. you know like, yeah um elaine is pointing out investment is a super fine plaster dust that's very bad yes. to breathe so that's something to be aware mm. of and bridger asked does this process have a noticeable smell is it just fire smells um, so give us some sensory details, I guess. Um, there, there definitely are distinct smells depending on the, um, the, the metal that you're working with. Um, if, if you get it like to that superheated state where it's super reactive and you start like weird fumes and stuff, it, it smells very bad. Um, it's, it's hard to describe, but, um, like very thankful that I was outside for that one. Um, <laughs> I don't think that when everything goes right, I have not noticed a distinctive smell. Um, I have been in blacksmithing situations where like the inside of the blacksmith shop, it just, you know, it's, it's like charcoal. They're just burning a lot of, you know, um, charcoal and, and coal and stuff like that in there. So, so those types of, of smells, but um, the really weird funky stuff doesn't, doesn't happen in a shop where you know what you're doing. <laughs> so I, I, my experienced character could definitely walk in and be like, oh, you overheated some, you know, kind of thing, because because that was such a distinctive <laughs> smell. Yeah, I mean, that, that was like one one alloy that doesn't have a lot of lot of historical use. A lot of people uh -huh. don't really recommend casting zinc for that reason, because it's it can do that easily, apparently, but that's what I had on hand. So that's what I used. Sure. Um, and then uh, continuing, uh, what are some typical minor, maybe painful, but inconveniences like, you know, the stubbing a toe equivalent um, that a character could be grumbling about even if they weren't on fire? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I would probably say uh, minor casting defects. So like, um, you know, you could have your character complain about a void or um, a bubble or uh, a fold is another one. So, so sometimes if you have, um, you know, everybody knows what bubbles and stuff are, but you can get folds on the back of metal pieces where the metal wasn't quite hot enough to really get all the way through. It's not quite frozen, but it's starting to form a cold edge as it's, it's um, you know, filling out the last little bit of a shape. So you can get um, like, almost like little river lines on on the back of something um, that that's called a fold. Um, that's just a sign that the metal wasn't quite hot enough. Um, you can get very small features like like say you're trying to cast a ring or something like that and most of the the shape will cast but then the very fine details maybe the metal wasn't hot enough to get into like the little prongs that are holding the gem on. Um, oh, so, I'm going to interrupt know, you, you for just one second. Yeah. We just got raided. So, oh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome raiders. We are in the middle of chatting with Emmy here about metal casting and specifically what we can take and to get that right in our, um, you know, historical or fantasy worlds and everything. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, <laughs> yay. So come Hello. on in and, um, and yeah, if you have any questions about metal casting, uh, Come jump on in. <laughs> yeah. Know. So, um, and uh, so, sorry, I mean, I'm gonna let you finish. Then I have another question that was in the chat. Oh, that's okay. So I, I think mostly just what, what I, the, the really like, 
oh my gosh oh no i'm actually disappointed um thing is is you you get a cast and it it looks good you think it's good it's covered in stuff but uh it it's mostly there and then you start cleaning it up and you find like oh there's a bubble or oh there that didn't cast or oh that's not good so um that would definitely have your your character grumbling a little bit that it it looks nice at first and then they on upon closer inspection disappointment awaits um, we have a request if you ha can link oh, to a photo of the um, haunted scrambled eggs. <laughs> I, I definitely have a video I can link to you guys. I, I can send it to you and you can put it in the show notes if you want. But it I like it's it looks very strange. <laughs> so if I am pouring my liquefied metal into my mm -hmm. mold and I know I need to have that small stream to allow the air to escape because air takes up space, but it pour a little too quickly and it globs. And now I think there's a chance that I've caught some air in the bottom and made a bubble. Is there anything I can do about that? Do I just make a lot of noise and stomp off to find chocolate? How do I fix this? <laughs> um, it, the speed of pouring isn't really going to uh, affect that so much. Um, okay. it, like it's, I mean, the metal is very, very heavy and air is very, very light. So, um, yeah, you can tell like gonna... I'm coming at this from a resin and silicone yeah. area where the bubbles are big deal. So, okay. It's, yeah, it's good. really interesting. Um, that kind of, there are some things that track really well from, from resin casting into metal casting. And then there are some things that are the complete opposite. Um, like, you know, how in certain resins, if you have a very, very thick part, um, the, 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 reaction can get going so much that it creates a lot of heat in there and you can have a lot of issues with it you know bubbling or doing weird things in thick parts well a lot of the problem spots in metal casting are the exact opposite they're all the tiny bits um but uh it's, sorry i'm losing my train of thought what was your question <laughs> <laughs> no that was it like um yeah. if if there is a bubble or a void is oh. there is there anything I can do about it? Or am I just like, ah, um, start carving some new wax? <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. yeah just start okay. over. Because, I mean, okay. you're, you're not... If you reach out and you're like, oh, what if I just do this one? Th that's a great way for your character to have very blistered hands, which I have also... Um, th there's been situations where, um, you know, well, oh, I'm not sure if that went in all the way. May maybe what if I just nudge the crucible a little bit just to just to vibrate it a little bit to see if I can shake it down in there. And then like the metal just spills over the side of the crucible oh. or um, okay. I like, I knocked the two halves out of alignment or something. And now I have like a shape that was supposed to be like this. And now the halves are like that. So it, it's better to just pray, like pour and pray. And then <laughs> let, right. just once it's, once it's poured, you just got to let it cool off and hope for the best. Okay. And then the question about is um, flame painted copper. Is that um, something that is, uh, um, sorry, I'm going to go back and, and get back to the, oh, yes. um, oh, where is it? I think that's the, uh, I think, I think that was a question about the joins with multiple casts, but Bridger, if I said, did that question wrong, you can correct me in the chat. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, so um, I've definitely, I, I I, I've seen that um, before where I think they're referring to like the different colors of, of copper depending on, on the heat that's applied. Um, I, I'm i not super duper familiar with that, but I, I think it has to do with um, certain oxidation products being formed on the surface of the copper depending on how much heat you're applying. So you can get a really like beautiful rainbow of colors depending on how you heat treat your copper um i i remember making like a hammered copper tray when i was very small with my dad where the final step was to heat treat it which made you know a lot of really cool colors appear but um i, I think that's where we're going that that's something that's a that happens a little bit after the casting because it's done um basically just on the surface of the metal it doesn't involve reheat remelting it or anything like that Okay. Um, sorry, I'm catching up with like, I'm listening to you and catching up with the chat at the same time. Um, so DM Stretch says uh, he was he had done some welding and one of the things that went wrong was uh, dipped the metal in the quenching trough, but not deep enough. So the hot water oh. shot up his arm. And I'm like, yeah, that's... Yeah. 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 Just don't, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, he, he dunked his whole arm and, and just got wet, but cooled off. So that's good. But, um, yeah, qu- quenching, um, you know, we were talking about misconceptions and this is, this is one that thankfully I don't see as often anymore. I don't know if it's because people got wise mm-hmm. or if it just became cliche, but the whole, you know, <laughs> I have to quench this sword in blood or I have to quench oh. the sword in the belly of a living human or, you know, whatever. And, <laughs> um, yeah, guys just don't, we don't, that's not how quenching works. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um, I, uh, interesting note. So, so I've seen water quenches and sometimes depending on what, what the properties of the metal you're using, you can also sometimes want quench in oil as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and depending on what oil you're using, it'll usually have like a higher, um, boiling point than, than water. So I, I'm not exactly sure of the physics of that, but uh, you, if you're setting up your, your blacksmith shop, you might have a container of oil for quenching in there as well. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> so yeah, Deem Stretch is in the, is in the chat and he's like, yeah, water oil for quenching. And then he called Jinx on you. Mm-hmm. So sorry. <laughs> um, so Bridger says we have deep fried swords. This is great. I love my chat. This is how we go all the time. <laughs> um, so I guess really quickly quenching versus letting it just naturally cool. And I know we're talking about different processes here. Oh, yay. We, I, I love that. Love when Emmy gets that face guys, buckle yes. in because it's going to be awesome. Like, okay. yes. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to, to explain this in as plain terms as I can, but the, the quenching versus, um, the l- allowing it to cool naturally, um, has a lot to do with controlling what kind of crystalline structure you want the metal to have. So if you imagine, um, the liquid metal kind of like water and then cooling down into a solid like ice, you can have a bunch of little individual ice crystals that are very small um, and kind of, you know, if you looked at it under a microscope, it would look very um, vagriated and, um, you know, very like salt and pepper type texture. Or you can have, you know, a very big uniform block of ice where all of the, you know, water molecules are oriented in the exact same way and the exact same crystal structure. Metal does a very similar thing where um, depending on how fast or slowly you allow it to cool, um, it will form itself into either one, um, you know, very large crystal structure, or it can have a bunch of little points where it starts cooling all over and you get these, these grains that, you know, if you have a whole bunch starting at once, they're eventually going to run into each other and you're going to end up with that same varied texture. Um, And that is going to produce a very different performance based on what you want your metal to do. So for something like a sword, you want it to be um, pretty hard and resistant to to impact and stuff like that. You want it to be able to hold an edge. Um, Whereas something like maybe I'm making copper wire where I want it to be very ductile and very, um, you know, easily manipulated. The, the single, you know, one mono crystal type stuff is going to be a lot more malleable and soft as opposed to the bunch of little crystals all, all stuck together. So if you want a big crystal, you just allow it to cool very, very slowly, which allows that one single crystal to kind of like overtake and control the entire like mass of metal that you're you're allowing to cool. Whereas if you want something with a bunch of little tiny crystals in it that are all, you know, mishmashed up against each other, you want to cool it super duper quickly. So that's where you get into the quenching the sword and stuff like that, because you want to create that that crystalline structure on the the inside of the metal. Awesome. Thanks. I I love like guys, this is why I wanted to bring Emmy on because Emmy Emmy talks the nerd in in a way that I understand and I love it. So <laughs> yeah. Um are there any other questions in the chat? Um because I'm just going to open that up um and then we will we've been we've been running for a little over an hour now, so we'll wrap up if we if we don't have any questions, but um I do want to say that Emmy uh, also does uh, uh, fiber weaving, all those things. Like, oh yeah, so I have a loom behind me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I would like to bring you back at some point in the future to talk about that because um, I know that I, I watch your your projects and um, going by on social media and 
they're amazing and you've got a ton of information that would be useful again for historical or fant fantasy settings so um yeah so uh <laughs> yeah so shy red foxes yay fiber arts friends yeah, you guys <laughs> you guys the two of you will get together and just have all the viking fiber like yeah. chit chat yeah just That's let the rest of us coping in on mechanism. that for 2020 is fiber arts. That's Just, fair. That's yeah. reasonable. It's better than liquor. There we go. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, what is your next casting project? Are you trying anything new? Um, I, honestly, I am. I have a metal project coming up, but um, I don't. I don't want to use fire for a while because <laughs> I'm tired of all of my Lost Wax projects failing. Um, so my next metal project is actually, um, I'm, I'm going to try to do Chasing and Repose. I'm probably not saying that right, um, but it's the type of, of metal working where you have a sheet of metal and you hammer it into a bunch of different shapes. And so that what I was going on before about the, the crystal structure and the ductility and everything like that, um, that you you can cause a metal that has gotten really work hardened and brittle to become soft and malleable again if you heat it up to the point where you allow those crystals to kind of rearrange so there will be fire not as much fire as with casting but um that that's what i'd like to try and dabble in next is a is a chasing project okay cool um, and I'm being asked about, um, do you stream? So I do like, why don't you give us your, I've got your Twitter, uh, username yeah. up, but give us your roundup of social media I, where everybody can I'm, find your I'm projects. the same. I'm super easy. I'm the same across all social media because nobody else has claimed either of it. <laughs> so, um, I do occasionally stream on Twitch. Um, I just moved and I'm still trying to get my workshop set up, but if I can get, reliable enough internet out in my my workshop i definitely will want to stream the, the chasing project that i'm going to be working on um if not i'll probably just take video and throw up a, a youtube thing later but um i'm i'm primarily live on twitter um where you hear me snarking about stuff and working on costumes and things like that but uh, i i do occasionally stream on twitch as well um yes yeah, so uh hang on let me people are asking in the chat it is ivor rivet um, exactly as you see here under her Twitter username, that is mm -hmm. also her, her Twitch name. And, uh, that's your YouTube name, right? Too. And that's I like all the things. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the things. So, um, so yes. So I have a rivet everywhere. Um, and yep. she's worth following. She puts up nice pictures. They're very, they're oh, very cool and you. inspiring and make <laughs> me feel like I'm not doing anything with my life. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, uh, that's a good place to wrap. And then I will, uh, I would love to have you back to talk about, um, historical fiber because Absolutely. that is a huge, huge thing. Hey, thanks seeker for throwing the Yay. Twitch link up in the chat. Um, and guys, thank you so much for coming and joining. And then, um, and sewing is half the battle. Who was, oh, we've got a YouTube link up too. Yay. Good. Thanks, Kate. Um, sewing is half the battle who was in the chat earlier. Um, she is doing her stream now where she is actually talking about applique. So let's hop over and raid her. Um, and then if anybody, um, yeah, you guys are welcome to come back next week. Here is the, is that the create -in? I think it's the create -in. I have no, I've lost all sense of time. Um, yeah. I think next week is the create -in. Um, I don't know. I have a calendar for these things. We'll check the calendar. Um, and then, oh, hey, thanks for the follow. Um, Dragon Love Water, which is a great name. Um, and then, yeah, so we're going to go raid Elena. And I can't, on, I can't talk and type and sewing's half the battle. That is too much. Oh my gosh. All right. Too much, too much, uh, too many letters. Um, so, uh, if you want to see some really, and I know she's showing some cool stuff because she picked it up from my house to share. So <laughs> I know it's coming in. So Emmy, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Everybody give Emmy a follow and then I'll let you know when we're going to have her back. And, um, yeah. And then we're going to hop over for the raid. All right, guys. And, um, the raid is counting down.